interest of time, we do want to get started. My name is Ann Toplovich. I'm director of the Tennessee Historical Society, and it's my privilege today to introduce Edwin Black, author of an important new historical work on the dark history of eugenics in the United States. But first, I need to uh, give you a word from our sponsor, the Southern Festival of Books, regarding support for this festival. This is an important event for Nashville and the region, and we hope that you enjoy the sessions and other activities you'll attend this weekend. You'll notice this year that it, after, at the end of each session, there will be some students holding a fishbowl for donations, and there will be places elsewhere in the festival site. So we really hope that you'll consider making a gift so that the festival may continue into the future. Also, please note that Mr. Black will be going directly to the signing colonnade in the War Memorial Building's atrium after this session, and his book will be available for sale there as well. Edwin Black began his career in journalism in Chicago and also worked as a foreign correspondent in Jerusalem and the Middle East. An award-winning and New York Times best-selling investigative author, his books include IBM and the Holocaust, The Transfer Agreement, and a novel, Format C. His latest book, War Against the Week, was released early last month. Mr. Black's enterprise writing has appeared in numerous newspapers across the United States and Europe and in the world's leading magazines, from Playboy and Reform Judaism to Der Spiegel. He is the winner of many awards from his peers and other groups, and he's been nominated for the Pulitzer Prize five times. He has also appeared on TV programs as diverse as America's Most Wanted and Oprah. His latest work, War Against the Weak, chronicles the story of America's decades-long campaign to create a white Nordic master race through eugenics. <laughs> As part of the campaign, 60,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized in eugenic efforts organized by American philanthropic organizations such as the Carnegie Institution and the Rockefeller Foundation. In our own mountains of Appalachia, many of these steril sterilizations took place. The program was then transplanted to Germany where the Rockefeller Foundation, an American eugenicist, founded and funded Nazi eugenics. To assemble war against the weak, Black headed a team of some 50 researchers working in dozens of archives in four countries and accumulating some 50,000 documents. And I have to say the documentation in this book is outstanding. Reviews of War Against the Week are appearing in major US, U.S. newspapers and magazines right now, such as the New York Times, USA Today, Esquire, and Mother Jones. Reviewers call the book scary and necessary, fierce and compelling, and what may well be the best book ever published about the American eugenics movement. Ladies and gentlemen, Edwin Black. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to come to Nashville. I'm very happy to kick off uh, this festival. And um, can everybody hear? Good. Now, uh, I'd like to tell you uh, that I'm going to describe uh, what is a 600-page book with 1,500 footnotes. I'm going to uh, summarize as best I can. Most of the information is in the book itself. Uh, as I said, um, I'm happy to be here. But none of you are going to be happy to hear what I have to say. It's not good news. You're going to get angry. You're going to be shocked. And at the end of my uh, discussion, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Um, first of all, uh, we are talking about eugenics. Now, most people are familiar with Nazi eugenics. This was Hitler's idea for a master race. But very few people are aware that the idea originated not in Nazi Germany, but in the United States two to three years before Hitler, two to three decades before Hitler came to power. As American eugenicists went on a campaign to create a white master Nordic race, blonde and blue eyed. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about the idea of eugenics. Eugenics itself started in Victorian England. There was a scientist, his name was uh, Francis Galton, <coughs> the uh, cousin of Darwin, Charles Darwin. And this guy, Galton, had these ideas that uh, if, um, uh, if talented, skilled, and wealthy people married other talented, skilled, and wealthy people, they would have talented, skilled, and wealthy children. And he thought by this method, 
uh, we could improve society. Uh, he tried to put a number on this. He tried to find a pattern in this because he himself, of course, was a seeker of patterns. He was actually the um, inventor of fingerprints. Uh, actually, God invented fingerprints, but he was the inventor of the method of identifying and classifying fingerprints. He was the inventor of various fashions of meteorology and uh, barometric readings. And so he tried to find a way to quantify the idea of a good marriage. And he came up with this term from the Greek that he invented, eugenics, meaning good life or, or, or good birth. Um, these ideas were imported into the United States at the turn of the last century, meaning in the early 1900s. Now, what was that time like? It was a time of great racial, ethnic, and demographic upheaval and conflict. What did we have? We had uh, millions of Jews coming in from the East, uh, from uh, Eastern Europe, from Russia, from Poland. We had millions of blacks in the uh, post-Reconstruction and post-Civil War era. Uh, who, were be, who were being uh, integrated into United States society. Indians were being integrated into United States society. Millions of Asians had come in from the West as demographic, uh, as indentured um, uh, laborers. And millions of Mexicans were now uh, in U.S. territory as, as a result of Mexican-American wars in which we took over a great amount of Mexican ter territory. And there were a bunch of white guys some scientists, some wealthy people, uh, men of privilege, people who, uh, whose names most people don't know, names like Charles Davenport and Harry Laughlin, and they wanted it the way it was. They wanted it the way it was when their fathers were running the country. And of course, uh, w when we say the 20th century, we ask ourselves, who is running the 20th century? The 20th century was being run by guys from the Civil War, just as our 21st century is being run by guys in the post-Vietnam era. And these guys from the post-Civil War period brought all of their racist baggage into the 20th century with them. <clears throat> they considered themselves reformers. They considered themselves liberals, progressives, and utopians. And their idea of a utopia was a world in which no one would exist who did not resemble themselves. This all came at a time when Mendel's principles of heredity had been rediscovered and proliferated in the United States. Now, just to refresh you on Mendel's principles of heredity, this is where the uh, P's, there's a blemished P and a, a, and a non-blemished P, and the next generation, some are blemished and some are not. These men thought that the same principles that guided peas guided the development and generations of human life. And they believed that poverty was a genetic trait, criminality, chastity, morality. So in other words, you weren't born into poverty. Poverty was born into you. And the best way to get rid of poverty and improve the world was to get rid of the people who had this genetic trait. As far as they were con concerned, it didn't matter if you took an African, put him in a white toga, taught him to read Latin, and put him in Italy. That did not make him a Roman. That's exactly the type of language that they used. So it was not the character of your, uh, of your family. It was not your wealth. It was not your position or your education. What mattered was whether you were of defective ancestry racially unacceptable, eugenically unacceptable, and whether your progeny would create more defective individuals for society. And this is what they wanted to get rid of. They believed, <clears throat> they believed that you could breed a better human being in the same way that you could breed a better uh, herd of cattle, a field of wheat, an ear of corn, and consequently, the government agency that put these guys together was the U.S. Department of Agriculture because they wanted to breed a better species of man also. So these guys obtained immense amounts 
of corporate philanthropy to back their ideas. I'm talking here about corporate philanthropy engaged in ethnic cleansing. The Carnegie Institution, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Harriman Railroad Fortune, pouring the, the, the equivalent of millions into the coffers of these gentlemen to, uh, to, uh, to establish research facilities on Long Island and elsewhere that would study how best to eliminate all of the defective, unwanted, unfit, and unacceptable types of human beings that they considered eugenically out of bounds. Now, what were some of their methods that they wanted? The first method that they thought about, one of, one of the first, was gas chambers, public gas chambers. Now, remember, we're talking about the first uh, 20 years of the 20th century, and they thought that the best idea was to march these guys into public gas chambers uh, in groups uh, organized on a township or a county or a village basis and uh, within a period of time these guys would disappear but they but they concluded that our society was not ready for gas chambers even still uh, some individuals uh, freelanced for instance there were uh, mental hospitals in Illinois one in particular that I describe in the book in Lincoln L Illinois who fed their new patients milk from tubercular cows and in so doing uh, infected uh, these new patients and then they uh, allowed them to sleep in open dormitories uh, to cross infect the others and by this method they would have a 30 to 40 percent death rate of new patients and tuberculosis of course was uh, uh, in that era uh, as bad if not worse than uh, AIDS is today. Uh, there were other doctors uh, uh, who would leave newborn infants who were defective or deformed uh, lying without any help or nutrition on the delivery table. One in, one in particular gained national notoriety. Uh, he was called the Black Stork. He was such a hero of the eugenics movement. Um, they actually made a movie about this guy, which you could see at the corner cinema for 25 cents or sometimes a nickel. But in the main, they believed that euthanasia would not achieve what they wanted to achieve. And so instead, they opted for forced surgical sterilization and uh, they got it. They obtained legislation in uh, 27 states that forcibly sterilized some 60,000 Americans. In addition to forced surgical sterilization there was marriage restriction, marriage annulment. If they didn't like who you were married they unmarried you. And, of course, there was the uh, uh, effort to create concentration camps, which they called farms or colonies, for those who were um, feeble-minded, uh, so-called feeble-minded, or racially unacceptable. They started out by calling these colonies for the feeble-minded. There were several in um, New Jersey, in Massachusetts, and uh, eventually they, uh, 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 hundreds of thousands of individuals were incarcerated and then forcibly sterilized uh, uh, because they were deemed to be unfit. Now, what kind of people are we talking about who are unfit? We're talking about Southern Italians. We're talking about Eastern European Jews. We're talking about blacks, Indians. We're talking about Asians. And we're talking about white guys with brown hair. They believe that white guys with brown hair, the hillbillies, the, the hill folk, many of which uh, were in these parts of Tennessee, uh, were basically bastardizations and mongrelizations of the white Nordic ideal that, uh, they lion that they lionized. In fact, the state of Virginia published a booklet entitled Mongrel Virginians about these mongrel human beings. And they came up with a number of ideas on how to um, uh, identify these people and one of them was the alpha test and the beta test. It was a mental measurement test and this mental measurement test might ask a southern Italian who knew every opera in Aria uh, about a Broadway musical. He'd come into Ellis Island, they'd ask him a question about Broadway musicals. You might get a, a, a black guy from the farm who had never been to a big city and they would ask him something about a cosmopolitan magazine. You might get a, a, a Baptist kid from a, a rural America who would of course 
course, never smoked. They'd ask them about tobacco ads. They would ask people about tennis rackets who didn't even know what tennis was. And by this methodology, they were able to conclude that 70 to 80 percent of the Jews were morons, 70 to 80 percent of the blacks were morons, and these people were worthy of sterilization so that they could not perpetuate their kind. This test, the alpha and beta test, was ultimately uh, evolved into something we know today as the IQ test. It's the, <laughs> it's the same basic test, but it's evolved. Now, uh, there were so many things that were upside down about this. The ophthalmologists of America, if you can possibly believe this, went on a national crusade to identify everybody with a vision problem, find their entire family, round them up, put them in concentration camps, and forcibly sterilize them as a way to improve vision in America. There's a whole chapter about that. They actually took the first step with, a, with a, a bill entered into the New York legislature, although this bill was um, uh, defeated. Uh, uh, although these laws were in 27 states, there were many people who felt that this was unconstitutional, and so there was a kind of a go-slow approach. Uh, and so a fraudulent collusive lawsuit was created in Virginia for the purpose of making eugenics a test case. Uh, the state of Virginia wanted to sterilize the mother, the daughter, and the granddaughter of one family. It was a famous case, Carrie Buck, her mother, and her daughter. So the state of Virginia... Uh, colluded with the court-appointed uh, uh, attorneys for Kerry Buck and um, wound a fraudulent appeal right up through the Supreme Court. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a staunch eugenicist, ruled for the majority that um, uh, it is better for all the world, that's a quote, that these three generations be sterilized. Quote, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And in so doing, opened the floodgates and ultimately, as I said, some 60,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized, many without even knowing it. Some, they said, were voluntarily sterilized. They would get some girl from the hills uh, uh, of Virginia or Kentucky or Tennessee, and they would ask her, uh, Hi, honey, do you, do you like the movies? Do you like the cartoons? She'd say, Yeah, I do. Do you mind if we do something to help out your health? She'd say, Sure. And uh, they'd say, Fine, voluntary sterilization. Uh, ultimately, um, this was not only national policy enshrined in legislation in 27 states, it became the law of the land. And backing it up was fake science and fake academics from the highest corridors of Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and Princeton. It was the greatest of our um, uh, universities that provided the sham science to back up these racists. Now, just so you understand, we are not talking about a bunch of guys running around a pickup truck with a Confederate flag behind them and a gun rack in the back window. We are talking about the, bright, the brightest and the best, the elite, about the greatest America had to offer. And all these laws were endorsed and debated by 27 legislatures in 27 states. This was not an isolated matter. This was not a matter that never went into Im uh, to implementation. It was um, uh, a national attempt to engage in ethnic cleansing, and it was supported by corporate philanthropy. Now, it wasn't enough to do this in the United States. These guys, the American Eugenics Movement, wanted to do this worldwide. And so the Carnegie Institution began to uh, sponsor pseudoscientific uh, medical journals, international congresses, and research fellowships uh, around the world, especially in Europe, uh, to proliferate our ideas into other countries. And we did this successfully, sponsor, uh, g getting uh, cohorts of uh, American eu eugenics to sponsor legislation in Canada, in Belgium, in Scandinavia. And a particular pet project of the American eugenics movement was Germany. And they successfully uh, um, transplanted American ideas of uh, eugenics into, uh, into Germany into the 20s and ultimately the 30s. And in, the, and in the 20s, it came to the attention of a guy called Adolf Hitler. 
and Adolf Hitler studied American eugenics, American eugenic laws, and American eugenic theories, and he um, uh, uh, conceded openly that he admired them. He admired them. And uh, he took his pre-existing racism, his pre-existing anti-Semitism, and wrapped it in the idea of eugenics to scientize and medicalize his theories, and then switched the word Nordic race with Aryan race to create the Nazi quest for the master race. And he even acknowledged in fan mail to American eugenicists, such as one to uh, a Madison Grant, uh, America's chief racist, from the American Museum of Natural History, when he said, your book is my Bible. And so, I've been writing about the Holocaust for 35 years, and I finally understood what Nazism and the Holocaust was about. I've always said you can document it, but you'll never explain it. But if we listen to the words of Hitler and his inner circle in a common phrase that they used, he said, National, so National Socialism is nothing but applied biology. And so it seems that even more than a war of territorial conquest and economic plunder. This was a eugenic war, a biological war, backed up by a genocidal military. And in fact, the Rockefeller Foundation spent millions to build eugenic institutions from the ground up. And one of the institutions that they were building from the ground up was controlled by a guy called Atmar Freiherr Verschur. And Verschur, we might say, was the chief Nazi eugenicist. And Verschur received grants from Rockefeller. And Verschur had an interest in twins. In fact, twin research was the holy grail of research for the eugenics movement. Because with twins, you could unlock the mysteries of defective reproduction. And with twins, you could reveal the secret of multiplication of the master race. And for sure, had an assistant. And the assistant's name was Josef Mengele. And for sure, sent Mengele into Auschwitz to finish the program originally started and funded by Rockefeller. And so millions of Jews and gypsies and other Euro Europeans were unloaded boxcar after boxcar into Auschwitz amongst terror and noise. And the one word they each, they each heard twice was the word twins. We want twins. And these twins were gathered and horrible experiments were done on, uh, on them. Horrible. They were fused together, their veins were tied together, their eyeballs were, were experimented with. They were given terrible viruses, pain, painful injections in, in the eyes. And we have spent a half a century trying to understand the unfathomable nightmare experiments of Josef Mengele. But every American eugenicist understood what a Mengele would do. Because every day Mengele worked on his scientific reports, his clinical autopsies, and dispatched them two or three times each week to his boss, for sure. In fact, after the Holocaust, for sure, was actually welcomed back into the fold of scientific fellowship by his colleagues in, Cal in California. Now, after the Holocaust at Nuremberg, eugenics was deemed to be an act of genocide, a crime against humanity, and the Americans went underground, and the Germans on trial quoted the words of Oliver Wendell Holmes in their own defense. They entered the California statutes, and California at all times was the state where one half to one third of all sterilizations took place. 
and they were found guilty. And then the Americans changed the name of American eugenics to human genetics. Same guys, same buildings, same film, f philanthropic funds, same laboratories. And over the, the span of one or two generations, this science of human genetics has evolved into the modern science of human en engineering that we know today, which is peopled by, um, by uh, 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 sensitive scientists who are trying to improve mankind and fight disease. And we certainly welcome and invite every genetic miracle that we can have. But now there's a resurgence of the same impulse that caused eugenics in the first place. I'm speaking of new genics. And this time, it will not be racial dogma and national flags. This time, it will be globalization, profit, bottom line, corporate activity that determines who is fit and who is not fit to continue their existence. I give you an example of uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe engaging in secret testing of the DNA of its employees for the purpose of identifying who, have, who has a predisposition to carpal tunnel. The largest employer, and this was just to avoid work, workman's compensation, the largest employer in Canada canceling the death benefits in an automobile accident of a man of a certain ethnic background. They tracked his background and they realized he's from a group of people who have a uh, ancestral and hereditary blood disease. And they said, well, he wasn't qualified for insurance in the first place. And so now there's a new move to exclude and to, sur and, 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 and to surcharge individuals for insurance, to underemploy them, to non-employ them, real estate, if you can't get insured and you can't get a job, then you can't get real estate. And legislators are seeing this as the new threat of discrimination in the 21st century. And anti-genetic legislation is already embraced by nations all over the world. And this legislation is in our Congress now, shortly after I speak. The first vote is going to take place in the Senate to adopt anti-genetic discrimination laws to stop gene lining. We all remember what redlining was. Now it will be gene lining. And so as we go into the dazzling 21st century of genetic genies, we hope that as many miracles as possible come our way, but we also ask that Wall Street and these corporations and our society look over their shoulder and make sure that genetics does not return from whence it came. Thank you. And, and now I'll uh, take questions. And in the interest of the patrons, if you could stand up and ask your question loudly, we'd appreciate it. And also I would ask that uh, because we have limited time, no, uh, no speeches or commentaries, although many of you may be outraged, and I'll just try to answer as many questions as possible. Who has the first question? Uh, it's quite frequent that people get, uh, are just stunned by this information because there's so much there, people are quite angry. Does anybody have a question? Okay, then I'll use my time to give you more, more, more information. A lot, of, a lot of people ask whether IBM was involved in this because, of course, I did my last book was IBM and the Holocaust. And uh, I can tell you that uh, IBM was not involved in American eugenics. Um, that's one of the reasons American eugenics did not succeed uh, at the level it sought to, su to succeed. Um, uh, these uh, family tracings and, uh, uh, and, and ancestral records uh, were accumulated on Long Island and, else, and elsewhere on index cards and uh, plain paper forms. And as a result of that, um, uh, there were so many uh, millions 
of forms and cards that by the time the punch cards came into uh, greater use in about uh, 1920s, uh, there were too many to punch in. And so eugenics in, a, in, in America never achieved the ability to database, to cross-reference all the individuals because eugenics, remember, wanted to do more than get rid of the individual. They wanted the entire family, and that was the key. And they could never track the family as they wanted to simply because they lacked the database and capabilities that IBM could, could give them. By the same token, that's exactly why Nazi eugenics worked in Nazi Germany because IBM went in there from the beginning and or in offered to organize the Holocaust from the identification to the uh, uh, exclusion to the confiscation to the ghettoization to the to the to the deportation to the extermination of the Jews they organized it in terms of databasing in t terms of uh, uh, of uh, systematic uh, uh, file keeping record keeping and that's why eugenics worked in Nazi Germany now it's interesting that when I wrote IBM and the Holocaust, I thought that um, the uh, famous SS race card that IBM developed for Hitler's SS was uh, born in uh, Nazi Germany. Actually, the prototype of this card was developed originally by IBM New York for the Carnegie Institution of Washington in 1928, a half decade before Hitler came to, to power, as part of the 1928 Jamaica Race Crossing Project as the first step along the way to wiping out the existence of all black people on Earth. We should also understand that uh, while um, uh, most Jewish people and my parents in the Jewish community, my parents who went through it, know that uh, in the ghettos of Europe uh, in the 40s, uh, there would be what they called an action, that means an action. The Nazis would want uh, 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 Jews to, uh, uh, to kill or to work or to, to experiment on, and they would just see someone crossing the street and they would grab them. Well, uh, 10 to 20 years before this was going on, uh, they were doing this in Virginia with white people. Uh, they were uh, in the back roads of the uh, foothills. Uh, the uh, county wagon would uh, g uh, cruise up and down. They would see a uh, hillbilly uh, just um, laying by the side of the road, uh, maybe uh, fishing or having lunch. They would grab him. Um, they would uh, deem that he was um, genetically or, or eugenically unfit. They would uh, find out where his cabin was back in the hills and hollers. Uh, get the entire family, maybe 10 or 12 people, commit them all to the institution for the feeble-minded, and um, uh, forcibly sterilized them all. And uh, this, is, of course, was officially sanctioned by the, state of by the state of Virginia. Before I go on with more op oppressive, shocking information, does anybody have an additional question? Okay, let's go on further. I I'm glad I'm having the opportunity to give you the information. Margaret Sanger was a famous eugenicist. You have to un 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 understand this was not just a movement of a, of a couple of weird guys. This was entrenched national policy and this was embraced and advocated by the, by the uh, power structure in the United States. Uh, all the presidents of, of the United States, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, FDR, um, uh, Harding, uh, and uh, in the case of Margaret Sanger, uh, there is, of course, a huge uh, um, uh, controversy as to whether she is a racist or not a racist or anything of that nature. And the documentation shows that uh, Margaret Sanger was not a racist, but she was a bigot. She was not a Nazi or any kind of a Jew hater, but she surrounded herself with the greatest Nazis and Jew ha ha haters in the United States, people so virulent they, um, uh, they got fan mail from Adolf Hitler, and she did want to save humanity, but only the top 30 percent. And so terms like human waste and human weeds populated her speeches and her publications uh, as she tried to relieve the teeming masses by ensuring that they stopped teeming. Now, how did I get all this information? Well, I, I deployed about uh, 50 volu uh, volunteer and other researchers uh, into some 110 archives and libraries in four uh, countries, generating some 50,000 documents, as has been said. 
and everything was done on a primary basis. We didn't trust uh, any of the materials that we have uh, found printed on the, ma uh, on the subject of, eu of eugenics. We have found that almost everything on the Internet about eugenics is either all wrong, half wrong, or partially wrong. And it's very important for me to make sure that my information is bulletproof. And so um, we, of course, have a one footnote folder. Uh, but behind every footnote, there are some 1,500 in the book, 100 pages of footnotes, and within 30 seconds, we can pull out the written documentation, original documentation, on virtually every footnote. And it's important to understand that many of the individuals who have written about this have done pioneering work, but there are errors, and uh, we have hopefully corrected those errors for, for, the fu uh, for the future. My book only begins the sad saga of investigation of eugenics. I've taken you to this, um, to this dark, frightening house of horrors, but um, uh, about half the information that I found was never used. Why? Because eugenics, which was an international movement and a national policy, was implemented on an intensely local basis. And so I could have written 50 books. And actually, that would have only been the start. And so now we need many, many more investigative journalists uh, to uh, explore the attics and the closets and the basements and the dark corners of this terrible house of eugenics to uh, discover the additional stories. And maybe after uh, 20, 30, or 40 books, will we begin to understand just the dimensions of this problem? Now, here's a question. First 75 pages of your book. I'm in the process of reading it now. Were there any well-known figures at the time whose uh, alarm bells went off for them and they were speaking out against this movement? Was, was there anyone we could point to who said, you know, th this is a really bad thing, something terrible is going to happen? That's good. That's a that, that's a good question. Uh, she wants to know if anybody who was prominent or otherwise uh, uh, spoke out against this at the time. And the answer is plenty of people, the majority of Americans. This became public knowledge, of course, because there were public laws passed starting from 19, uh, 1907 and 1909. This became public knowledge. And the Polish people, Jews, Italians, blacks, and, Ita and Spanish people, they didn't want to see themselves wiped out. They thought this was all wacko, that this was nuts. They couldn't believe that anyone was doing this. And so there's a great deal of public ridicule in the newspapers among the investigative reporters. And consequently, these men persevered in the face of public ridicule. So even as um, uh, people are declaring that this is sham science, it's leaps of logic, these people are just inventing more and more phony data and phony signs to support their racist ideas. And uh, what's interesting is that in 1938, uh, as late as 38, um, when Hitler is uh, pushing Jews across the borders of Europe to create a refugee crisis, the governor of the state of Connecticut uh, secretly hires one of these Carnegie Institution uh, um, uh, uh, experts to conduct a eugenic survey of Connecticut and to determine who can stay and who cannot stay based upon their racial uh, profile, their health, their uh, mental well-being. And they, their plan was to uh, score everybody racially and ethnically and genetically and eugenically, and then to uh, simply expel the ones they didn't like to their ancestral homes in Kentucky, Massachusetts, New York, or uh, uh, perhaps Tennessee. And in so doing, create domestic refugees. So uh, it isn't that people didn't object. It's that these were the men who had a grasp on the halls of power. Sometimes just one man would go on a personal crusade to lobby an entire legislature and uh, uh, in, in enable legislation to p persecute and, uh, um, and discriminate against so many different types of people. You know, this is what it's important to understand, that if you're willing to get rid of one ethnic group, one minority, you're willing to get rid of them all. And that is why I'm delighted that this book has resonated not only with Jews, but with blacks, with Hispanics, with, with, Asia, with Asians, and all people 
who have an understanding that once one man sets, sets himself up as the biological tribunal as to who can live and who cannot live, we are facing a potential for genocide. Is there another question? This gentleman here. How relative do you think this, uh, this is in today's world, especially with the uh, evolution of, uh, of our social society? Uh, how, uh, rele uh, how relevant? Yes. How relevant is this to, t to today? Very relevant. We don't have eugenics as we had it then. We don't have that today. Although there is that entrenched minority in the Aryan Brotherhood and in the, and in the white racist community that want to practice the identical same eugenics, they have hooped this to their chest as a, uh, as a crusading banner. But there is, of course... Um, this whole privatized notion of human life. And this has got to stop. Um, uh, there's an 18-month uh, 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 secrecy uh, protection for patents. Human life is being patented. It's subject to NDAs. Um, and so we're going to find out after it's been done. Now, what's interesting is that all this genetic information is being sold to the highest bidder, and the company that's been established to... Uh, purvey this information worldwide is a company called IBM Life Sciences Nordic, the same people who organized the Holocaust for Adolf Hitler. And so what we need is to remove the secrecy, remove the NDAs, and say, if you're experimenting in human life, it's public. There's nothing private about it. You cannot brand human life. And remember, the abuses that we fear, which took 30 years to transmogrify, from uh, wacko ideas in Long I Island to genocide in Auschwitz. That was at a time when there were no PDAs, no fax machines, no internet. These ideas that we have today could transmogrify a lot faster. And so what we, what we want to avoid is that the, uh, uh, the genie of genetics be used to persecute, or to conduct a new war against the weak. It should only be used to help. All signs should only be used to help, not to obliterate another group of uh, people. I hope that answers your question. Is there another question? Anybody else? All right, how much more time do I have? Because I can talk forever. All right, yes? Um, during World War II, when FDR refused to bomb concentration camps or even bomb the railroads, taking people to them, um, would he have known personally of the American connection, or uh, would that have kept him from, from taking any really great strides to, to do away with the campaign? Oh, that's a good question. And, uh, his, and, and what about the American First Committees? Would they have been influential? Yes, of course. Uh, the question was, uh, FDR refused to bomb the uh, death camps in Nazi Germany. Of course, he did bomb right next door to the uh, uh, rubber factory. Uh, and... Um, uh, is it, uh, was there any, did he have an understanding of this eugenics? FDR was a backer of eugenics. He, uh, in fact, when he was governor of New York, referred international inquiries about the worth and value of eugenics to some of the chief Nazi, uh, n Nazi uh, 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 proponents in California, such as Paul Popino. And, uh, but as to whether the uh, camps were bombed or not for eugenic reasons, I do not believe that there is a really good tie-in there. What I will say is there is a concept we in the Jewish community know of called paper walls. Why couldn't the Jews get visas to come into the United States during the 30s? Many people have uh, speculated that FDR was... Um, uh, was uh, uh, anti-Semitic, or it was too bureau bureaucratic, or there was politics, uh, all these different notions. But we now know from the book, we have now revealed, that uh, uh, the tenor of the times was expressed biologically in a um, secret network of eugenic stations and eugenic protocols set up throughout the consulates of Europe by the Carnegie Institution um, uh, as a part of its involvement with the 1924 National Origins Act. And so everyone who came into the United States um, uh, had to pass by a, uh, a, a eugenic standard. And uh, it was the Carnegie Institution that laid down the principle that um, uh, Jews, are a, um, Jews are a race, not a religion, which was echoed 11 years later by Adolf Hitler uh, very knowingly and tellingly in the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. Another question from someone? 
All right, somebody ask me who helped and who hindered. You want to know who helped my research and who tried to obstruct me? You do? Okay. Uh, they all helped. Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Institution, Planned Parenthood, all the organizations, and many small museums in Tennessee, in Appalachia, uh, all helped my research above and beyond. The only one who refused to help my research was, of course, IBM, which refused to allow me access to its archives. Uh, and um, these organizations uh, should by no means be judged today by what th their, um, they were involved in uh, 50, 80, and 90 years ago. Uh, that um, uh, Even then, they were involved in much, much more than eugenics, and uh, we should be aware that these uh, organizations uh, are regretful of their past. Um, before I uh, carry on another, does anyone else have a question? Go ahead again. Uh, life sciences Nordic. What is that, and why are they being mentioned? Why are IBM mentioned? Life Sciences Nordic is um, pre-positioned to get all the national DNA uh, 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 data banks and other uh, genetic information and purvey it to the highest bidder, uh, and they're managing it. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that these people are uh, that the people who make up this company. Uh, are uh, dedicated, uh, decent scientists as uh, all the people of IBM are today. But uh, I do know that IBM operates in secrecy, that IBM operates uh, for the bottom line, that IBM obscures what it's really doing. And so since we are talking about hum human life, and since we are talking about human en engineering, I b believe that the same request I made of all of genetics uh, applied to IBM and to any other company that wants to trade in uh, human material. And that is, take away the secrecy, tell us what you're doing, who you're selling it to, uh, what the f and what the, uh, pur what, what the purpose is. I think it's interesting that they should uh, um, uh, call the name of this company IBM Life Sciences Nordic. Another question? We're done? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Colonnade, and I, it's a fascinating read, and I recommend it to all of you. So thank you, Mr. Black. Thank you. And author Edwin Black is just one of over 200 authors appearing this weekend at the Southern Festival of Books in Nashville. As we head outside.